Hello, this is one of two videos that replaces our lecture for Tuesday night, March 5th. Chapter 5, Ancient Greece. Uh, you'll see the dates here. Um, you'll please know that, um, that the Hellenes come to the area of Ancient Greece after the disappearance of the Cycladic civilization, the disappearance of the Minoan civilization down here in the island of Greece, and the disappearance of the Mycenaeans or Mycenaeans. Um, again, the Hellenes come from, well, some people think they come from the west and they inhabited this region. I'm going to deal with the chapter in a, in a slightly different way. I'm going to call out um, and talk about the sculpture first, and then we'll go to the architecture very quickly, and finally to the painting on vases. Um, please know that this civilization is different from uh, the others we've studied, or especially different from the Egyptian, in the sense that they embrace progress, that we can see a progression, a development in the art, and it is very easy to see, I believe, um, and that there are these three different periods um, that we tend to use to distinguish like major changes. The archaic period dates here, classical, which is the one you probably uh, recognize most easily, and then the Hellenistic. Throughout, I'll try to mention some of the cultural values um, associated with the Greeks. Um, but you can check your textbook on that as well. So first we're going to the Archaic period, and again this is 600 BC to about 480 BC. And um, evidence in sculpture uh, are these uh, Kurov statues. The word just is Greek for boy. Um, these statues are of men, of young, young men, um, heroes, uh, usually over graves. Um, so they're open-air graves, um, unlike the Egyptians, and they tend to commemorate very specific people um, with inscriptions. Uh, the inscription is lost here, so we just call this one a kuros. Um, I want you to notice that uh, it is very much like an Egyptian statue. So here's a statue of an Egyptian we didn't look at, but I want you to stop the video and kind of do a compare and contrast. I hope you would notice that they are uh, very much alike in many ways, uh, in function not, again remember this is open air and this probably would be inside a tomb, um, that they look alike in terms of the development of the human body, for the most part, definitely in the pose, right? Um, uh, but less so in the Egyptian attachment to the block, here in the arms as well, um, the Greeks free the figure from the block. Uh, and um, and also they uh, tend to um, take the clothes off. These are nude statues. Um, this one is particularly interesting because uh, facially it is a little more abstract than probably what you're used to in Egyptian art. Moving along in uh, the archaic period we have this statue um, and again, development is the word, artistic development towards a kind of naturalism. That's what we tend to think of when we think of Greek art, especially that that is of the figure. Um, this guy is called Kroisos. Uh, that's his name we know from an inscription, but he is one of these kouros, one of these boy or young male statues. And again, uh, it was seen at his grave. Um, these, these statues are for the most part life size. Uh, and again, you see all the all the typical things that pose, um, the freedom from the block, um, the the highly developed muscles, uh, and perhaps maybe one other thing that's added to this, um, the smile. This is something called the archaic smile, and we'll talk about it when we get to the classical period. Uh, if you do a comparison, just in terms of, you know, uh, moving from a Okay, an early archaic to a, you know, a mid archaic. I hope you can see again the instances of naturalism creaking, cre creeping in. Um, some people notice that there's a geometry to the body here uh, that gets a little still noticeable, but it gets a little softer here in the later archaic. Again, a kind of stylization, which is again just repeating patterns. Um, of the knees that gets just slightly more naturalistic and softened here in the later archaic. 
things get blown out of the water though about 480 uh, BC. Uh, at this moment, um, politically, things have changed. Um, the various Greek city-states led by Athens um, helped defeat an encroaching enemy, the Persians, or over here in the ancient Middle East. And with that defeat um, comes a certain amount of confidence, or at least this is what our cultural historians tell us. And therefore, we see in, in the sculpture a kind of a change as well, especially in the male figure, um, definitely moving more towards naturalism, um, but some would argue more towards a, a, a more confident stance. So here's our first example. He's called Critios Boy again. That is a uh, specific name, um, his name, a Kuro statue. He's a sm little smaller than most. Um, and he's the first to use, or he's the first that we found, to use this uh, new stance, the contraposto. Um, if you don't know what this term means, please know it now. Um, I'd almost ask you to look it up if this, but, but it's just a video. And essentially, it means counter positioning one part of the body against the other. So you'll have a straight leg and now a bent knee. Um, you'll have one shoulder moving out towards you, one moving back. Sometimes if we had arms in this statue, they fell off at some point in its history. Uh, one arm up, one arm down, maybe the, the head cocks one way. So this kind of uh, strict symmetry that we see, these stiff knees that we see in the archaic period get blown out of the water here in the classical period with this new confidence um, and naturalism and with the invention of contraposto. Contraposto can be exaggerated, um, and here's a statue, a very famous one, uh, called the Discus Thrower, as you can see. And sometimes it means, you know, one leg, one foot flat against the ground, the other uh, raised a bit. Um, the figure twisted in an exaggerated way, um, but nonetheless, this is um, still illustrates Contraposto. Now, probably the most famous of the classical statues is this guy, uh, the Doriferous, or the Spear Bearer. Um, and as you can see, he's, um, again, got the straight leg and the bent leg. Uh, again, arm up, arm down, uh, head twisted, or, or turned slightly. Um, let me just say that he is created by Polycolitis, the uh, artist, the sculptor. How do we know this? Well, there was a, a Greek author, his name is Pliny, Pliny the Elder, who actually tells us about, um, at least he gives us a list of the names of the f artists who were working at this time and of their famous statues. So um, he tells us about, um, not much about Polycolitis, but he does tell us that he makes this really famous statue called the Spear Bearer. One small thing, again, in this age of confidence, uh, the archaic smile uh, that we saw in the early statues disappears. And most of these classical statues, this guy, well, let me do this, this guy um, are almost um, indifferent in the way they uh, present uh, to us in, emotionally. And we'll talk about that too in terms of control of emotion that we see here in this period of essentially triumph in the classical period. The contradictory thing about these statues, again, they seem so naturalistic, but they're at the base of them. A very Greek concept is um, that there have to be laws, there have to be certain kinds of laws, and that's why the Greeks are so well known for their philosophies. Um, and in this case, the law is that the body is well proportioned. What does that mean? Well, here illustrated in this drawing by Leonardo, who studied the Greeks, um, that the body is, you know, a, a beautiful body, is as tall, you can see the square, it's as tall as it is wide, and that there are natural joints in the body. In this case, there are four here at the elbow, here at the middle of the chest, at the elbow again, that break the body down into four equal units measurement wise. And that's the same for the height as well. So the joints here at the knee, at the groin, and uh, at the chest lines. That's one fourth the height of the body another fourth of the height of the body, etc. And the system actually gets more complicated than that. Um, 
the reason why this statue, uh, Polycolitis doriferus, is so um, important is because it is said to have utilized this idea of good proportion. Now the third period where we see a kind of disjuncture, it comes around 320, 323, uh, and again something political happens. Those very free and confident uh, city-states uh, led by Athens. Well, it's a really complicated story, if, and if you've taken history, you probably know that. But um, uh, let's just say that for this class, that uh, 323, um, the city-states lose a lot of independence, and they are ruled by a courtly system, um, by a king, uh, Alexander the Great. This is his time, for example. And the art uh, is, serves a different function. So earlier, uh, those statues, the Kuros, stood on graves. Uh, I neglected to say that these statues stood out in the public to inspire people, men, uh, to be uh, good and perfect uh, citizens, and not just beautiful in body, but uh, engaged in society. But when we head to the Hellenistic period, um, the, sculpture, the, the function of the sculpture changes. They're there to entertain. Um, an example of this is this uh, weary Her Heracles, or Hercules. Um, you probably know that he does some labors, and here he is shown very uh, tired after those labors. So again, the earlier statues would show, would show us confident, moving, um, confident, standing, ready to spring to action uh, kind of sculptures, uh, but but really in a state of, um, of calm, like that guy. Um, but this uh, shows us some, you know, emotions that are, that are, that are not so stellar. Uh, weariness, tiredness, probably some depression as well. So uh, Hercules uh, uh, weary after his labors. Uh, if you stop the video right now and do a compare and contrast, I think you can see uh, the difference, the proportional system. It's still it's still there, but it, it's starting to fall apart a little bit. It's like, really? Those shoulders? Um, again, uh, the Hellenistic statues tend to be over-muscled uh, often or, um, again, uh, depicting uh, kind of emotions that are not you know, not the serene, controlled emotions of the classical. Somebody's going to show us this. Uh, uh, one of the student presenters will tell us about this uh, very famous Hellenistic statue. Uh, but suffice it to say that most of the Hellenistic statues tell stories um, that are, you know, not necessarily apparent in this, you know, this is just a spear bearer. He's holding a spear, but there's a story behind the Hellenistic statues. As there is behind the, this last Hellenistic statue, I'll show you. Uh, it's a bronze statue. Uh, one of your presenters is going to tell you about the Greeks making bronze. Most of these statues we looked at are marble, um, but bronze was actually uh, a very popular um, material in, in this age. And it's of a seated boxer. Again, there's a story here. He's defeated. He's uh, if I had a better slide, if you could move in the details, you could see that his nose is broken. Uh, he's got some dings on his, he's got some scars and dings on his flesh, some wounds. Uh, and, you know, he's tired too, and he's looking up, you know, seemingly not so eager to uh, take on his opponent. Okay, I'm going to stop here and, and put in a short video on the female statues, which are slightly different.